about today is the overall picture of biodiversity dynamics. And so what I wanted to do, I was initially going to just talk about islands and evolution on islands, which is my main research. But I just wanted to talk to you a little bit also about some of the more exciting things that we're doing on campus. And uh, this is through um, the Berkeley National History Museums. And I'll talk to you about um, the overall picture of, of um, biodiversity dynamics, just understanding the history of biodiversity and how, what, how it might change as we go into the future. So um, with this kind of general idea in mind, the campus started what is now known as the Berkeley Initiative in Global Change Biology. And this was something really spearheaded by the Vice Chancellor for Research here, Graham Fleming. And the idea was to couple knowledge of past response to climate change with, an, with the analysis of contemporary evolutionary and ecological processes. So to put this information together so that we might be able to predict the vulnerability of species and the, the kinds of ecological and eco evolutionary processes that might be, be important for sustaining diversity. And whether we can use that information to to, to kind of figure out where we, the, the best strategy as we go forward. Um, so the idea here is that we've got this, this series of collections, of historical collections on the Berkeley campus, including a CESA, the Ethnic Museum of Entomology that I'm responsible for. There's also the Human Evolution Research Center with Tim White at the head. Um, the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, the UC of Jet Stub area, and um, the UC Museum of Paleontology and the UC Botanical Garden. All of these represent collections that go back uh, over a long period of time, over a hundred years. And so they have that history of collection and, and how change has happened over that time period. In addition to the collections, um, Berkeley has, uh, well, UC in general has a whole series of uh, reserves across the state of California. And each of these are very rich biologically and um, serve as, as places where we, can do, where we can do research and where we have done research over a variable amount of time. So we've got the, the museums then that um, have this tremendous record of response to past climate change. And also they go back in deep time with the paleo record. And what we can do is then integrate the information across these different museums and bring together researchers in um, different departments to focus on those collections. This, is, this, this has been our idea. Coupled with that, then, we've got the field stations and with, that have been examined in terms of forestry, fire, grazing, and disease. And so they have a history of intensive research over the last hundred years, very good, depending on the age of the field station. So what the idea then was to use these resources and couple, couple the, these resources with the expertise that we have in computational biology, computational biology, developmental biology, evolutionary biology, ecology, genomics, biomechanics, agriculture. Berkeley has this tremendous wealth of expertise in all of these different areas. So the idea then was to, to build this program that capitalized on all of these different aspects that the campus has. And so through funding from the campus, as well as initially from the Moore Foundation, we got a lot of people together to focus on these resources. And I just want to give you just a couple of snippets that have come out of this. These are just um, the main people involved, and I'm just going to highlight a couple of them. Um, so I'm there with Charles Marshall, who's in the UC Museum of Paleontology, and um, we're really um, we're here up uh, here. We're we're um, responsible for coordinating this. And just to give you an idea of a couple of a couple of the efforts that are going on, this is one that's led by Cindy Louie, who's in the UC Museum of Paleontology, and Cindy has been working with um, a bunch of different people with. Um, Richard Dodd, Tony Van Ossi, Kip Will, Fred Fisher, um, Roger Byrne, and, and Charles Marshall. And what she's been doing is doing a core into this, um, into Clear Lake, which is a bit north of here. And trying by do, doing that core, she's getting all sorts of organisms that have lived in that um, area. If you 
poured down over the last 150,000 years. So basically what she does is dig a, a core and you get these quantum rec records of change at that this one site um, at, at Clear Lake um, over the 150,000 years. And then um, use couple that with lots of little bits of information that we've accumulated across California just to get a broader representation of change across the state and integrate this, this data to try and understand how change has happened over the state over time. So what they've done at the moment is just get the core and what they're doing now, this is just a picture of what they're, they're actually doing it, they just did it just um, a few months ago and so this is basically what it looks like and it's got these layers that um, include pollen, diatoms, um, insect remains, mosses and all sorts of different things, isotopes, so you can get a picture of how change has happened. So that's just one effort that, that we're coupling the collection with this expertise to try and understand change over time. Another effort that I'll just highlight here, just to do, this is just a smattering of them, just to show you the kinds of things that we can do. So this is an effort that's um, led by Craig Moritz and Eileen Lacey, um, coupled with, with various people, Rasmus Nielsen, Mike Eisen, Maggie Kelly, Todd Dawson, what they're doing is focusing on one area and the collections that have been made in this one area. And it's a transect through Yosemite that focuses on these little squirrels, these chipmunks. And what they're doing is getting genomic and stable isotope information from chipmunks that were collected 100 years ago and chipmunks that were collected today. And they're comparing chipmunks that one, that um, the alpine chipmunk that has decreased in abundance over the century and one that has not changed at all. It might even have expanded its range. And so just this is a complicated and busy slide, but what I want to show you here is, um, if you see, this is up here, is the alpine chipmunk here. This, this Here you see the range has contracted in this one. In, sorry, this is the, the studiosis. It has not changed its distribution at all. So what they're doing with, with um, the collections of the alpine chipmunk and the, chip, the, the collections of the studiosis that hasn't changed, they're trying to figure out signatures of adaptation that have allowed one species to adapt and, and according to the change in the environment and the other species to, to, um, to weather it out. Um, to, to, sorry, to contract its range. Um, so they're looking at signatures here. They're doing this um, genomic analysis of the historical samples and the recent samples, and they can get really detailed information um, from historical samples. This is just showing you that the historical samples actually provide better genomic data than the, the recent samples. And they can pick out just by comparing this with historic and recent samples, and they're just looking for signatures of selection um, for, uh, when you compare, oops, sorry, when you compare the, the, the two sets of samples. And so this just shows you the power of, of the historic and recent sampling to understand how things either adapt or don't adapt over the century. Um, the last project I'll just highlight here, Neil Tsutsui, who works on, on bees and ants, um, he's been working here with um, Todd Dawson, Claire Kevin, um, Gordon Friday, and um, Santiago Ramirez. And what they're doing is they're getting the bees together with the pollen that they collect. And so what that allows you to do, then they're, 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 they're getting the, the current bees with the current pollen, comparing this over the century to ones that were collected 20, 30, up to 100 years ago with their 100-year-old pollen and trying to see if there's a signature, signature of change both in the bee and in the pollen. And so just, just very briefly, basically the answer is yes, this is on the left, you just see the signature of isotope change, that this is from, from the past to the present, and you get a very marked change in the signature of the isotopes collected from the pollen that these bees were getting over the course of the century. So this is basically comparing the historic bees and the current bees and giving us a picture of how the environment has changed over time. So with that information, we're going to be able to go on and build much better predictions of how, the, how things are going to change as we go into the future.
the problem, though, with all of this is that there's a huge amount of information, some of it good, some of it bad. And we're trying to put all of this information together to try and get a detailed picture of change over, over the past. And this is where, again, through this um, Global Change Biology Initiative, we've been working with the Keck Foundation. And what we're doing here, this is, this is another little area of the same overall effort to try and understand change over time. But this one is focused specifically on information. And so what we're doing here is trying to um, integrate information that you get from, from collections, so from the, all the museums, like the, these are the, the, the collections that we have here in the Berkeley Natural History Museums, and these are collections that we have from the field stations, and various other little bits of, of data that we have from specific sites. What we want to do is get that data and put it together with data the, from layers that, that, um, that GIS people get, so, so layers of vegetation, climate, rainfall. And the idea is to integrate this, this information from the specimens and from the, the layers of, of vegetation or rainfall or whatever, and put that together and try and get a better representation of how change, genotypic, phenotypic, adaptational change is happening over time. So this is a very ambitious effort, um, but I'll just tell you roughly where we're at with it and how it's going. Um, so the first thing is getting the specimen data from the museums. And you think, well, you know, that's fairly straightforward. And certainly for some of the smaller collections, it, it's um, for the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, they've got all of the data in digital format, so you can access all of that, that data associated with the vertebrates. The Museum of Paleontology, they're working on it. The Jepson Herbaria, the, the, the UC and Jepson Herbaria, they're also working on it. But for the insects, we're still, it's still an issue. The problem is that you've got all of these specimens here. And each of these specimens, here you just see a tray of butterflies. Each of these specimens has information on where it was collected, when it was collected, um, the kind of environment that it was collected in. We want to get access to that information. And how do you do that? The information is actually underneath each of these specimens. So you have to peer under the specimens and find it. And there are millions of them, millions, millions of these things. So at the moment, we've currently digitized just 150,000 of the 6.5 million specimens just in our museum. And that's so less than 1% of the specimens. So what we've been trying to figure out is how do we speed things up? Yes. So that's an excellent question. So what we want to get is information. We wanted to um, put in information about exactly what the, the organism is and where it was collected so that we can try and figure out how the distributions have changed over time and all of the associated data, like um, the abundance of this particular invasive moth, for example. It only appeared in collections, say, in 1963, and since then it's just virgin. Um, can we, if, if this is the kind of information we should be able to, to see there, and coincidentally we should be able to see increases one in one with decreases in another. And at the same time, we're going to put in information on the, how the, the ecology, the phenology, all of these kinds of things that, have, that are associated with that one organism and how they have changed over time to get a broader picture. Yes. That is, that's.
even those that are, you know, different people are going out, so they're different, different collecting methods. So what we've got this group at the moment that are actively working on what you can do with, di with incomplete data. I mean, at some level, you can, you start, well, you pull, you pull over both space and time. And at what, you know, how much pulling do you have to do to get any signature out at all? So this is the kind of, there's, there's a statistical group that are working on the first part of the project who are, who are trying to figure out just what data, we, whether there is anything we can get out of this. I mean, at some level, especially if you come towards the present, where we are systematically getting this data, we'll certainly get a lot out of it. And for certain questions, like the Grinnell Resurvey Project, we'll also get some specific um, answers out. The, the, the more broad scale, um, use of the collections and figuring out change over time. We'll get something out of it. Whether we'll get those distributional changes at, at what level, we're, we, we really don't know. But the, the idea now is to, is to get this in digital format. And, and it's that's, so just so that we know what's, what's there, when they were collected, and um, what we can do with it. So this is actually where we come to um, a bit of astronomy. Um, so what we've been doing, at least in the, the, the biggest problem with this, is um, the entomology collections. And so we've been teaming up with um, the Adler Planetarium in, in Chicago. And they were responsible for developing what's um, been called Galaxy Zoo. I don't know if you've heard of, of this effort, which is a big um, citizen science effort. And the idea is that you've got a lot of images of different galaxies out there, and um, the more eyes that can look at a given image at a given at a different time, um, the, the better. And you get errors associated with um, people looking, lots of people looking at a given at a given image and categorizing it according to the type of. I, I feel very bad about talking about this stuff. There's people that know a lot more about astronomy than I do, so I won't say anything more. But but it's a huge effort and tremendously successful. And through the, the people at the Adler have now developed lots of different um, efforts. Galaxy Zoo is just one. Oops, sorry. Um, but there's there's the the old weather where they tracked um, weather records over the ocean over the last um, hundred or, or two hundred years, and they get an, a very accurate assessment of how temperature has changed over the ocean. But again, just using people out there to look at these records and put them into to databases. So what we have been talking to, to the Zooniverse people about is doing the same thing for, for specimen data associated with the collections. So um, Arthur Smith, who is, who is at the Adler in Chicago, and Andrew Hill, who is with this company, Visuality, They've been working with us to try and um, see how we could get this kind of information that you see up there that's associated with this beetle. How do you get this into a database? And how do you, when, you know, you can't just kind of put an image up there and say, oh, come people, just get that into a database first. You need to engage the public. You need to get them involved in what they're doing. Get, um, I mean, that's part of this is an educational initiative so that so that um, the general public can see the value of getting this information into a database so that it can be searched and integrated with other pieces of, of information. So that's just one of the, um, the big issues with getting this information um, digitized. So once, once we have this data in a, in a database, in a searchable format, what we want to do then is integrate the information across these different collections, across the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, the um, entomology, the, the herbaria, um, the, the um, paleo collection, and put this together with data that's been published and um, the genomic data. If we can get all of this data together, then we can start to get a better picture of change over time. So this is, as you can imagine, it's a big programming effort in these three people at the bottom. Um, Ginger Ogle, George Gross, and Michelle Cruz are all um, major programmers who are really into this. Um, but I'm just going to say that they're um, doing a tremendous job right now. But um, at the same time as they're doing the work on the specimens, there's the big 
big work on getting the layers together. Um, the layers that, um, that of, of vegetation, precipitation, and things like that. Maggie Kelly and Kevin Coy here with the GIF facility on, on campus, the um, Geospatial Innovation Facility. They've been um, putting this together. They developed a program called CALADAP that allows you to see how layers of, of, of precipitation, temperature, etc. have changed over time. And they've got layers that reflect hydrology, soils, etc., etc. And so there's all of these layers of data. And then the real challenge, of course, is to integrate these, um, the, the point data and the spatial layers so that you can get some, some idea of how organisms have responded to these to precipitation change, temperature change, um, etc. So basically the idea is putting these point events associated with the given collection events, etc., and plunking them down onto the spatial layers and getting a better picture of how change has happened over time. Um, and this is a very boring slide, but it's very, um, it's just basically, Kevin just came up with this just um, two days ago. And it's very exciting because it shows that the actual progress has been made in terms of both integrating the different kinds of data and integrating with other efforts that are going on elsewhere and just figuring out there's a clear pathway as to how we get information out and how we get it to where it can be kind of hooked into other programs and analytical tools. So that was just a, a whoosh through um, this effort that, that we've been doing, the, the Global Change Biology Initiative. What I want to do now is just tell you a bit about what my specific research is and how it relates to the whole issue of change over time. What I'll be doing now, just, just to start off with, is going back a little bit in time. So we're now talking in, um, more, in more deep time as to how change has happened as you go back millions of years. But in a, in, within an identical identifiable chronolo chronological time frame, as you'll see in a second. So what I'm doing is looking in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and here you see the islands of Hawaii that are stuck way in the middle of the, of the ocean. You often don't realize just how far and out they are. But they're, they're extremely isolated little islands out there. And because of that, very little has been able to get to these islands. But one thing that has got there are spiders. And so you think, how did spiders ever get to these islands? And here just shows you how spiders disperse. And what they do is they go up to something high, let out silk. You see it's putting its little abdomen in the air. You see silk is coming out, and it, the wind pulls and pulls, and then poof, the spider takes off. You see that here's the wind pulling pulling again at the bit of and off it goes. And so this is the primary mechanism that spiders use for dispersing. It's called um, ballooning. And so this is presumably how they get to these very remote islands. So here you have Hawaii. So why is Hawaii so wonderfully spectacular for looking at evolutionary history? And the reason is First of all, that it's supremely isolated. It's the most isolated archipelago in the world. But also, and because it's so isolated, very little could get there, at least initially, before humans got there. So it's not only very isolated, meaning that very little got there, it's also arranged in this chronology from these um, different ages of the islands that, that you see here. So it goes from the youngest island of Hawaii up to the oldest island of Kauai. Basically what happens is that the lava oozes up under the ocean. And so it oozes up towards these volcanoes. The volcanoes move away from this hot spot that's being formed. And as they as they as the, the, the islands form, they become high, move away from the hot spot, they become eroded and go down and eventually disappear. So within this kind of framework, you can actually see the different stages of evolution with the, the most mature stages on the oldest island, the youngest stages on, on the youngest island. So this kind of framework has been the basis for, for some of the most spectacular radiation. 
variation. And this is just one of them. These are the Hawaiian honey creepers, which are um, very similar to the Galapagos finches. But um, if you if you know about the Galapagos finches that, that Darwin talked about, he talked about how they their beak was modified to feed on different kinds of food. In Hawaii, you have the same group that, that colonized the island. They diversified in the same way, but the beak shape is just much more spectacular. And the reason is, is simply that they're bigger islands and they're much more isolated. So very little else got there. So basically, these birds took over most of the, the aerial niche for birds. There were others, but most of them, um, I won't talk about them right now. Um, the other groups that have done a similar thing, this is work that Bruce Baldwin, who's here in, in Bird of Biology, he's been working on this silver sword radiation, which is um, put in, in several different genera, but they're, they're basically the same lineage, but they look so very different. You've got the big silver sword, the little shrub things, the little florets, and just and the trees, and they're all very closely related. So just a big radiation of things that, that got there and just went all, all over the place. Um, one of the best known of um, the adaptive radiations, as these are called, of organisms in Hawaii is that of Hawaiian flies. And these here, they, they um, this is a tree, and I'll talk about these in a second, but they just show the relationships amongst the flies. And these are, on the left, they're host associations, and you can see their major host associations have changed kind of low down in their relationship tree. And then they still kept speciating. And the reason that um, they seem to keep speciating is that they've got this very elaborate courtship behavior. And if we just see here, um, just so you can see, they, they, this is a male on the towards closest to me, and he's dunking pheromone on the head of the female there, and she's deciding whether or not he's, he's good enough to mate with, um, just based on what he smells and tastes like. And so it's a very elaborate courtship behavior, and it seems like speciation is really on the basis of this, this elaborate courtship behavior. Um, so that, that, the speciation there happens really fast. What I've been doing is working on spiders. And in spiders, what's nice is that they're very um, stuck in an ecological environment. They often build webs, and the webs tell you basically where and how they want to live. And then they, they, they come out, they, you can go and collect them and watch them. They don't, you know, they don't see that well, except for jumping spiders, and I'm not going to talk about jumping spiders. But um, these ones are, they, they're very easy to work with and understand how they live and why they live, where they live. So let's just think about um, how, just a little bit of history as to how I ended up working in Hawaii on, on these things. Just to give you an idea of what the environment's like. Um, when you think of Hawaii, see, it might, it might be different because you go to the top of the mountain and you get a better feeling for, for what's in between. But when you think of Hawaii, you often think of the beaches and the palm trees. And as Mark Twain said, the loveliest fleet of islands that lies anchored in any ocean. The thing is, though, when you try and work in the forests of Hawaii, it's kind of a different story. And yes, they're beautiful, but gosh, they're hard to get up to. They're, um, the terrain is really steep, they're very, very wet, and access is also quite difficult. And so um, when I started working there in the mid-80s, it was actually very hard to get anyone to go with me, and all of these agencies required you had to go with someone. And so I found... Um, my mom, I brought my mom <laughs> from Scotland, and um, so she very, she was, she was great. Um, she came all through the Big Island with me and over on Maui. Um, but then, anyway, that's a long way between Scotland and Hawaii. Um, so I found someone else who would come with me, and um, this is in the early 90s, and this is George Broderick, who's in the department here. And he 
um, very quickly became my husband, um, <laughs> which made life a lot easier. And then we had offspring, um, who also, well, they weren't, he wasn't very useful at that age. Um, <laughs> but anyway, he got steadily more useful as um, time went on. He could actually carry the net and carry something. He looks like he is not enjoying himself, but they got a lot better. Um, so this is kind of the, the history of, of how of, of work there. But what, you know, what did I, what was so exciting? What made me want to stay there? And this is what I want to tell you about. So we thought the islands then, and as I said, you've got this, this arrangement from older to younger islands. What organisms have tended to do, the ones that have been there for the longest time, they tended to hop down from the older to the younger islands. So let's look then at patterns of diversification within lineages of spiders. So I'm going to tell you about the spiders, and I'm going to tell you how they're related across the islands. So a lot of what you're going to see is trees of relationship. And these are based on DNA sequences. And these are, this is a very simplistic thing. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with how you do this. But basically, you look at sequences of DNA and then see how they've been modified. And you group things according to how the DNA has been modified. So this sequence was the ancestral one. And then one of this, um, this C here got changed to a G in 3 and 4. And so they were grouped together because both of them share that chain. And in this one, this, this A got changed to a C. And so these two are grouped together because they share that chain. And this is what I show you, the trees that, that you'll see here. This is basically how they've been generated based on their on molecular data. So let's just look at some of the, the spiders then. This is work that I did with um, Gustavo Morriga, who's at George Washington University. And Gustavo, um, he described this spider, and he, he liked Orson Welles plays. And so he, um, he, he called it Orson Welles, and then all the species are named after the plays. But anyway, um, it's a really amazing spider. It builds a really big web. Um, but it's undergone what is called really a non-adaptive radiation. It's basically hopped down the island chain without changing. It does basically the same thing. It builds a big or a big sheet web and, and sits under trees, comes out at night, um, but hasn't changed adaptively. But there are a whole bunch of other ones that have changed adaptively. They've hopped down the island chain and diversified within the islands. And so this is what I want to talk about. From now on. So here's just one, I'll show you a bunch of different lineages of spiders that have done this. These are stick spiders in the genus Ariamnes, and they have this incredible diversity that you see here. These are just the Hawaiian species, um, and just a kind of a representation of them. Some are really shiny, like you see in this, this one here, up in the, this, this one here. Some are very dull and white. This is what you get in the dry forest of East Maui. Um, and some are dark brown. You get these down in the in the leaf litter. Um, so the the color tends to reflect the kind of habitat they live in. So what we did then was we generated a phylogeny and based on the, the DNA sequences and looked to see how that matched the geological history of the islands. And basically, what it shows is they hop down the island chain. We can time this based on on how much the DNA has changed. And you get this variation scattered across the tree. So what we did with, so they hopped down the island chain, but you get that there's no real pattern in how this, this great diversity in color has changed. So what we did was we looked um, in the context of the, of the color and the kind of ecology that they have in the context of, of this tree. And what's really interesting is this, what I've boxed up in the yellow here, I'll just show you just to see again. In the yellow, look at where the boxes are. These are these gold ones that live under leaves. And so they pop out all over the tree. And then there are brown ones. These are the brown ones. 
that live down in the vegetation. And again, they pop out all over the tree. So what this is showing us is that there's a clear pattern of evolutionary convergence, repeated evolution of the same ecological forms. So that's just one group of spiders. But then we started to look at this one big lineage. And these are the long-jawed orb-weaving spiders. And I'll just show you here. Just to give you an idea of what we do here. Um, so we collect these things. This is just um, a spider that, for whatever reason, decided to stay out in the day. And I'll see if I can get this to play or not. Um, maybe I won't get it to, to play. You never quite know whether these things are going to work. It doesn't really matter. But it, just to show you um, how, how they're collected, does it matter? Um, so they, um, you collect these things then um, most, almost entirely during the night. And this is when they're active. They don't see you, and you can really see their, understand their ecology. So what we did then was we, we collected um, now this bunches of this one genus, and they're all very closely related, and they're tremendously diverse, all in this long-jawed orbital spider te genus Tetragnatha. So the ancestrally, they build these orb webs, like you see there, but the, within those orb-weaving ones, there's just this gamut of diversity with tremendous specialization. This is just from, from under ferns and in Maui, this is just from the summit of Mount Paul on Oahu. This is just the wet forest of East Maui. This is the lava flows of the Big Island. This one here just feeds on amphipods on the summit of the Kolas on Oahu. So they're incredibly specialized and tremendous diversity. You also get ones, these ones here that you see with the photographs that, that um, David Lichwager and Susan Middleton took. Um, these are the, the ones that you see just sitting out there, they don't build webs, and they represent another radiation that's just been, um, become a cursorial predator. So what we, based on molecular data, what we found is, is that they've diversified both within ones that, that just run around and don't build webs, this one, this group here, and ones that do build webs and are still very diverse. And you get rapid diversification of, of both of these forms. So how do they diversify? And so I'll just show you just a couple of examples here. Um, these are the web spinners, and what I uh, had a postdoc, Todd Blackledge, who looked at the forms of the webs and measured all of the, the forms of the webs. And what he did then was he did principal component analysis on um, the web form, and he mapped that out in in space. So basically. This is just representing ecological space. You can imagine it like that. So um, on the top left, this is one place on Oahu. And so this is one species that sits kind of here in ecological space based on the measurements of the web. This is another species that sits in this space, and this is another species that sits in this space based on the, on the measurements of the web. Likewise, this is Maui, and you see they're well separated in ecological space there. And likewise, in Hawaii, they're well separated in ecological space. So you see that you get similar web types when you bunch them all together. And so what Todd was interested in was seeing whether the similar web types were all related to each other. And here again, he found that, that was absolutely not the case. And so you get similar web types here and here. And then similar web type there and there, but and again here and here. And so the similar web types again have evolved repeatedly. So convergence within web types. The final story I'll just tell you in this context the spiny like ones, the ones that have abandoned web building. So here's a green spiny one, a, a big brown spiny one, a maroon spiny one, and a little brown spiny one. And you get green ones and maroon ones, little brown ones, big brown ones in every habitat on every island, pretty much. There's some gaps. This is basically a picture of where they all are across the island. There are gaps, and it's a longer story. But the bottom line is within any one habitat, you tend to get one of each representative of the big brown, little brown, maroon, and 
degree. So we, we then looked at how all of these were re related across the islands. What we find is a nice pattern based on all of this molecular data. You get a nice pattern of progressing down the island chain just like we, we, um, we, we expect, you know, from the older to the younger islands. But then, when we look at how they're related, what you find is that the green ones, see here, I've just colored them, these are the green ones, or all these here. There's the maroon ones, the big brown ones here, um, and the little brown ones. And you see that they pop up all over the place. So here again, rampant convergence of similar forms. So the bottom line, what, what we've been showing here is that you get within these lineages, you get rampant convergence to a similar array of ecological phenotypes on different islands. So basically, the ecological forms, like represented by this yellow, they pop up over and over again. And it's just the same set of forms that pop up over and over again. So what we're trying to do now is understand exactly how that happens. Yellow, but the interesting thing is that 
The yellows on the big island are always female, and the red fronts are always male. And then what's more interesting here, you cross a male yellow from Maui. Remember, you don't get male yellows on the big island. But if you cross a male yellow from Maui with a female yellow from the big island, the offspring will come out with this red front. Um, so basically, what we think has happened, uh, just, just looking back and saying, how, how could this have happened in the first place? So what we think happened was this. Here you've got Maui. They colonized the Big Island, and we, we can, we've got information from that based on the molecular data. So they jump over and get to the Big Island. And when they did that, they would have done so with an incomplete representation of all the colors. So just one or two would have got would have been involved in that colonization event. And then they, they arrive on the Big Island, build up a population. There would have been selection to recover the diversity of the ancestral population. So selection to recover all of this diversity. So the idea then is that there was convergence then to the same array of color morphs within a species, just but by a different genetic mechanism. So what we're doing now, and I'm not going to go into this at all, is what we're, we're, we're doing next generation sequencing, Illumina-based sequencing, and we're basically um, sequencing the whole genome of these spiders and trying to figure out exactly what changes have happened as they've, co as they've colonized from one island to the next and what the selective pressures might have been. So that's very much a work in progress, and we'll see how that pans out over the coming year. But um, before I finish, I just wanted to say, because you can't really talk about these islands without saying what has happened in more recent history. So I just want to talk um, just very briefly here about what exactly has happened and what might happen as we go into the future. So this is work by um, Pat Kirch, who's in the anthropology department here. And Pat has done some really fascinating work mapping the, the progress of, of Polynesians across the islands of the Pacific. So Polynesians started somewhere around Samoa and then colonized out into the outer regions of the Pacific very quickly and reached all of these um, very far-flung islands of um, New Zealand, Easter Island, up to Hawaii, but all the way through, colonized all of these islands um, very rapidly. So what happened then was um, you get very rapid increase in the population size of the human population. And with that, you've got um, a very um, a lot of warfare going on. So associated with that then, you can imagine the impact. So in particular, notice what, this is just a, a, a painting, but it represents what the, the kind of things that they're wearing. And if anyone's been to the Bishop Museum, one of the prized capes of the king was actually entirely yellow. And you say, well, you know, that would have been a lot of birds um, because it's all made of bird feathers. And certainly for the, for the red birds, you know, you can imagine the impact there. But the one that's all yellow is actually from a black bird um, that has um, just a tuft of yellow. So you can imagine the enormous impact it had um, on those birds, which are, of course, now extinct. And so, Associated with the arrival of humans, then, a dramatic loss of avian biodiversity. Um, this is the work um, of um, Helen James, just that they're, they're discovering these, these fossil remains um, in various caves on the islands. This is work from the Marquesas that David Stedman did, just documenting the species of, of birds that he's found in fossil samples, with the ones here in red all being extinct. So a tremendous loss of biodiversity with um, initial Polynesian arrival. Then, of course, um, Captain Cook came along with the best of intentions, and he mapped out the Pacific. What happened um, when he came was that he brought disease. It's entirely unintentional, of course, but um, with that disease, the population in each of these islands plummeted. Here you just see the blue is the... Is the um, the, at the time of Cook's arrival to the islands, the, the population size in Hawaii, in the Marquesas, and Tahiti, subsequent to Cook, the population, human population plummeted, 
And then since then, it's recovered. Of course, in Hawaii, it's much higher now. Um, in the Marquesas, it still hasn't recovered. Um, and Tahiti, it's, it's um, exceeded what it, what it was. Um, but the bottom line is that there used to be a very large population, and now there's, there's even a larger population. So the, the thing is, you've got um, organisms on these islands that have tiny populations, and so they're subject to, to um, the impacts of this arrival of, of humans with associated organisms. So the rate of extinction of, um, if it, this is just documenting birds, the rate of extinction on, on islands is extremely high, and the islands of the Pacific are the highest. So if we just look here, this is just an example just to show you what's happened. This is on Oahu, um, this is just looking at Honolulu. But basically the outside world has poured into these islands. In Hawaii you get more than 2,500 arthropods, 13 reptiles, 38 land birds, 19 mammals, 900 plants are now established, and this is just, it increases every day. Um, there's land clearance, conversion. You get some amazing things going on. This is um, when things first arrive, they tend to reach very large um, populations. This is a, a movie. I don't know if you can get it to, get it to show. Yes. Um, yeah, here, you, it looks like it's raining. This is getting off the ferry in Tahiti, and um, they're trying to see, well, where is the rain? And this woman is thinking, you know, there's not a cloud in the sky. Where's the rain? And it's actually from these sharpshooters that, that um, invaded the islands and then reached huge densities that, that these invasive things tend to do. And um, it's, it's come down a bit now, but they have a huge impact. Um, so basically what has happened here, you've got Hawaii in the middle of the ocean, and what you've done is basically shrunk the Pacific Ocean. And it's now just, just a, an island that's, that's very close to the mainland. So we've changed the dynamic going on in these islands. The isolation has been lost. So where does that put us as we move into the future? And this is what we, we just don't know. And this is something I'll just say here. I, I'm not, this, this always makes me cry. It reminds me if anyone's read the Lorax when it says at the end, um, you know, you think of the utter environmental degradation, and at the very end, when, when I read this to the kids, I just would always dissolve in tears. But it says, Catch calls the ones where you let something fall. It's a truffula seed, it's the last one of all. You're in charge of the last of the truffula seeds, and truffula trees are whatever in these plants. And truffula, truffula, treat it with care, give it clean water, feed it fresh air, grow a forest, protect it from axes at hand. And the Lorax and all of his friends may come back. So the thing is, you think that is far too idealistic, and um, how is it going to happen? And so I'm not going to leave you with that, um, just in case you think you're going to be entirely depressed. Um, there is, just to show you that you actually can do something, this is an area that I'm with it. There are kids a long time ago now, but this is in Oahu that's just been completely devastated. It's dry forest and it's been heavily grazed. And Art Gutierrez, who was with the National Park um, on the island of Maui, what he did was he basically got the community to go and just pull out the invasive plants. So they, he just got people to, to pull out the invasive things, and then they actually went in and planted the native stuff. And you think, you know, that's a lot of work. Um, but what's interesting, if you look on Google Earth, and you can you do this, you know, go, go back home with you. Look on Google Earth, and you'll see, if you look at the south slope of East Maui, you'll see this, this dark patch, which is where this restoration effort is going on. Um, so the forest has come back. And so here you see the, the forest just from the, from the a lower level. And you see, I mean, it's, it's, it's doing incredibly well. This is the inside of it. Um, so whether, whether the whole ecosystem is going to come back, we can hope, but it does show you that you can do something. And so I think the important thing that we can do as conservation biologists and people that are interested in preservation of the environment as we go on into the future is basically understanding what is there and getting the message out as to, as to why it's interesting. And also recognizing that it's not hopeless and that you can actually do something. So with that, thank you so much and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you.
thanks so much. And uh, I would say as well, um, Rosemary mentioned a couple of colleagues, Tony Bonofsky and Neil Tatsui, who we've also had lecture in the series. If you check our website, uh, there's videos of their talks. And uh, thanks to Chris and James at the back here, we're going to get uh, Rosemary's talk up here in a few days. But yes, uh, any questions? Yeah. starting to think now. And um, Mary Jane West Eberhard, who's a biologist down in, in Costa Rica, she's done a book on phenotypic plasticity and how that might play a role in facilitating adaptive radiation. So it's kind of this, um, the idea is that there's intrinsic variability in these organisms that can respond to selection. And so you get speciation within, you know, trajectory A, B, C, and D. Um, but, but it starts from a, an intrinsic flexibility to do that. And the reason you get, you know, the green ecomorph or the, or the maroon one, I mean, they look at really identical on the different islands, yet they're not each other's closest relatives. And so it's got to be a mechanism, like you suggest. With people working on sticklebacks have found a similar kind of thing, where you get um, a, an ocean-dwelling form coming into lakes, Repeatedly, they give rise to limnetic and benthic forms. And they're the same, you know, the limnetic forms are very similar across multiple lakes and the benthic forms. They do this over and over again as they've colonized freshwater lakes. And so it's again, the, the thought is that they've got this, this innate plasticity that allows them to repeatedly evolve the same form. So yes, that's exactly right. And we're trying to get, get at the molecular underpinnings of that right now. Yeah.
were looking at a series of lizards or mice or something in the water. If we're, if we're, if we're blind, we'd be there. We could, we'd know exactly what genes <laughs> are changing. But yes, that's an excellent question. Yes. Because, you know, one 
you're, what we've done is superimpose basically an ecological process with all of these things coming in on top of, of, of this um, deep kind of um, evolutionary process that has given rise to this, you know, repeated evolution of, of similar groups. So, to be honest, I think that the, the, the main thing that we need to do, besides just understanding what is there, is figure out exactly what happens when you juxtapose these two processes. You know, if, if, um, if, if you go to, the, to these, some of these places, you think, you know, how is that possibly going to work? There's an area on Maui that the Nature Conservancy protects, the White and White Reserve, that um, they, they've done a really good job of keeping the weeds out of the reserve. You go outside the fence, and there's, it's like an army of children that is just pushing at that, you know, literally just pushing at that fence. And you think, you know, how, how can this be sustainable? Um, so I think, I just think that, that if, we, if we focus on the details of the evolution process, I just think that we, we need to figure out more really what's going on in this ecological evolutionary interaction and try and see what can be protected there. But, but as I say, you know, the understanding what's there is a big part of it, so, so that people can, can see what, you know, what, what is worthy of, of protection. And in that regard, actually, you know, Susan Middleton and, and David Litchwager have done an amazing job at just taking excellent photos just to show what's there. And, you know, when, when I got to Hawaii, most of these spiders were, were undescribed. Almost all of them were undescribed. And so you just, you know, you spend most of the time just describing and documenting what's there so that at least, you know, there's more attention paid to these um, extraordinary, the, the biology of these organisms. Um, but I think the big thing is understanding exactly what's going to happen if you, if you put the two things together. Yeah. Thank you. 
population, just a kind of mistake of, of repeated colonization and juxtaposition of different populations. But, you know, how does that dynamic then play out into evolution? So you know we, we know we get these, these, these different pockets, but we know that these, you know, that the lava flows over time will, will get harder, so they'll be they'll come back together. The time of separation is not long enough for them to become isolated and physically distinct. So what, you know, what is, does, does that fragmentation play any role? It surely fosters diversity, but does it facilitate isolation? Unlikely. And how does that all play out in the context of, of species of living? And that, so I think the bottom line is, I think it's, it's not straightforward, um, but we're, we're going to, this is something that we're, we're, we're trying to get a handle on. So we're working with um, this guy, Rasmus Nielsen, who I think is involved in the, in the chipmunk project. Um, but Rasmus is, is um, his focus is population genetics and uncovering signals from, from genetic data to try and figure out the history of populations with key effects and how they diverge. But it's a lot of this ecology makes it incredibly hard to understand evolution. Right, right. So the, the, it's, it's just that the geology is very complex. And um, what we're trying to, I mean, it's, it's in the big picture, if you just say, well, this, I, this volcano is this age and this one is this age, um, Roughly, if, if you kind of blur your eyes and you say, well, that's roughly how it is. But if you talk to um, Peter Vasek, is a biologist down at Stanford, and he studied this island inside out. And we went to talk to him about the age of the different special substrates across the island. And, you know, when we spoke to him, we just kind of like tearing our hair up because he said, you know, it depends on the ash, you know. Because if the ash falls recently, then it grows, you know. The, the effect of the age of the, the geological age. And so, you know, we, we at, at, at the end of that, I didn't know what to do. But, but you do you do have approximately all, you know, the, the age structure of these volcanoes. So we, what, what we're thinking of doing now is just kind of looking a little bit farther removed and trying to see, you know, well, this is a community that we can say is very young. This is a community that we Older, etc. I'm trying to get a sense of it. Are there any more questions? Then please uh, 